I'm going to start this video by mentioning I've got a bit of a cold. Uh, went to bed feeling fine yesterday, woke up in the morning, blocked up nose, feeling terrible. So my voice might sound a little bit odd, but we'll just try and get by and I'll try not to sneeze on the workbench. So this is a power supply. That, it's a USB power supply. It's the new type with LCD display and it's faulty. I noticed a uh, really good quality control uh, when I peeled off the little set of translucent film from the front. There's a big speck of stuff in the screen under there as well. But what's actually happening with this, uh, it's a friend called Paul who bought it from, what was the company called? It was Gearbest. And uh, when you plug it in, I don't know if you see that, it just pulses. The display pulses, it displays the sort of 5 volt display and then it just sort of dies again, it keeps redoing that. Very uh, typical, it'll actually do it for a while after it's been unplugged as well. But he got it from Gearbest, uh, it's faulty, he tried using their online return form and it didn't work, the capture didn't work, the tick boxes didn't work, so he emailed them and they just didn't bother responding, so that's not a, a good demonstration of a customer service from Gearbest, but that's the point, he said, screw it, uh, I'll send it to Big Clive and he can, we can see if he can do anything with it or at least make a video out of it. So here it is, let's open it and see if we can make a video. So it's got a little seal here to stop uh, to stop us getting in. Oh, that's quite sticky. That's the seal removed now. Is this going to spudger apart nicely, or is it just going to make splintering noises? The case doesn't look super... That's not very good. Okay, so it wins points for accessibility to all the live connections. Here's the circuit board. It's not coming out easily. Oh wait, no, no, it's kind of pulling, but the front, oh, the front display is flexing. Oh, okay. So inside is uh, the display circuit board. How does that connect? It's got, uh, it's got 10 connections. It's got a 4-pin connector there and a 6-pin connector there. Technically speaking, if it's not really working, I should really discharge what I think is the big fat capacitor. I think it has fully discharged the fact it was still trying to run the circuitry, but it's, I see a big capacitor there. Where is the main side? Uh, the main side is coming in here. Uh, we get the mains coming in here. Um, it's going to, I reckon that's the main electrolytic. Let's use a metal screwdriver to just bridge. It's dead. That's good. And the hand test. Yeah, it's dead. So what have we got here then? Let's zoom up a little bit and we'll explore this together. So we've got the mains coming in here. It's going to these two pins. One end is going to a com mode suppression choke here. The other end is going through a fuse under there. This is where, incidentally, I'll be turning it backwards and forwards. When you're actually looking at circuit boards, you tend to flip backwards and forwards to see what's on the other side versus the tracks. And uh, when I watch other channels, uh, just at the point I'm saying, oh, what's that? They'll generally flip it over and it's like, no, I wanted to see that bit. So uh, my apologies if I'm doing that to you. So we've got the fuse from one of the input pins. We've got an NTC thermistor, which uh, is a, it looks like a black pastor, but what it does is it starts with a slightly higher resistance, and when you turn the power on, it heats up. And initially, it starts with a higher resistance, then it drops to a low resistance, and it just takes off that bang, the current surge when you turn it on. It, both those connections then go through the common wood suppression choke, and then... I'm guess yes, they seem to be linked to the other side, it's a double sided board, to a suppressed capacitor here, a class X capacitor, filter capacitor, then a bridge rectifier. The bridge rectifier is then going to this uh, electrolytic capacitor, which is menacingly mounted right next. Oh, it's glued onto the switch mode, either the switch mode chip or a transistor. That's not good that they've actually glued it onto that. It's commendable they've glued it down. I think I'd rather put a bit of glue at the end there instead of actually onto the side because they have physically... I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. It's all well shrouded. Uh, let's get a bit of momentary light in there briefly. They've glued it on to that uh, transistor in there. That, uh, that seems a bit odd. The transistor which is being driven by this chip... Right, let's, uh, let's analyse the circuitry here. So, 
This is a switchboard chip, the look of it. That's a transistor that's switching the transformer. There's the primary of the transformer. Probably. Yes, because it's in the... There's, here's a separation trail. Let's uh, draw this in here. The separation trail is coming along here. Then it's actually cut out like that. Then it seems to be going up and over to there. Then they've got more cutouts to keep a spacing, a minimum spacing here. So there's the separation path between the high and low voltage side. So both those connectors, which is reassuring, are on the low voltage side. And they've made efforts in this instance to get proper separation, which is reassuring. Not sure how good the transformer will be. You never really know until you open it up. So, the transformer has quite a few connections. I'm guessing this is primary because it looks like this uh, set of components here, a diode, uh, let's uh, get a wee bit closer to that, a diode, three resistors in parallel with a capacitor. Yeah, that's a snubber network. So that is uh, the snubber across the... Um, across the primary for the uh, switching, to cut the switching transient, to sort of clip that to protect the transistor. So if that's the primary, that must be the... either feedback... Is that an opto-isolator? Yes, it is. There's an opto-isolator there. Oh, actually, yeah, that's a fairly sensible circuitry as well. The output is a big cluster of capacitors. It's using a big fat diode here, coming from the output of the two... Yeah, they've clumped lots and lots of pins together uh, on this to handle this sort of high current from the secondary side. So it's going through that diode, by the look of it. Uh, going to those smoothing capacitors, and then there is a little feedback circuit, which is probably... It looks completely autonomous. It looks like it's uh, based on one of those TL431 type uh, shunt regulators with a simple resistive divider. So maybe it's just absolutely setting. I'm just scraping that and seeing if it's the... if I can get the text off that. I think that is a 431, if I've got that number right. Uh, so there's a little bit of circuitry there. With the matching uh, resistors and capacitor, which would set the threshold voltage, it's going to start shunting. And at that point, it's going to turn on the opto-isolator, which is going to signal back to the other side, and it's going got this control line going all the way back to the switchboard chip with a little um, filtering capacitor here, and that's what will turn it off. So I wonder if... Uh, one of the possible problems here, well, two two possible problems to cause that flashing. The This side might be sending, that, as soon as this side's powered, it may be sending a sort of disable signal back to the other side and then uh, not release it until the voltage has gone way too low. Uh, and then sort of enabling it again. There is an interest, there's another little chip here. Oh, that appears to be powering a different section of the circuitry. Ah, right, okay. This six-pin connector that's going into the back of this is just three pins positive, three pins negative. It's the main five-volt supply. This looks like it might be an independent supply that's powering, going across to power uh, the uh, control circuitry, the LCD display, perhaps, because that certainly what it looks like. Okay, so my first suspicion here, where's the meter? is that the, um, the bootstrap circuit might not be working. Now, when these circuits power up, initially, I'm going to doodle this out, in fact. I shall doodle it out and then explain what I'm looking for here. So, with a typical switch mode power supply, you've got the mains come in through some various filtering, and it goes through a bridge rectifier and gets converted to DC. Now, this is something that confuses people a lot, because they say, once it's converted to DC, it's going through a transformer again. The answer there is that uh, 
you can't normally just put DC through a transformer. What they do is they convert it back to AC again, but at high frequency. That lets them use much, much smaller transformers. So here's the output the rectifier. Here's the positive rail. Here's the negative rail. In the case of this, this is a UK supply, so it'll be about 330 volts in that. And there's a smoothing capacitor here. That's the big fat capacitor that was glued in place against a hot, uh, hot transistor by the look of it. And there'll be the switch mode chip, which will have its own little power supply. Uh, what's the best way to draw that here? Uh, let's uh, draw a little capacitor here. And that's the power supply for that chip. But what actually happens is this uh, chip can't necessarily power itself. It's not You get some chips that will power directly from this sort of a current limited supply from the mains, but... Uh, it's more often to have some trickle charge resistors, one or two, just going down and trickling that uh, until that capacitor reaches the voltage that this can turn on. That then turns on and uh, drives the main switch mode chip. So that would be driving a transistor. I'll just draw a standard NPN transistor here uh, with the primary winding. And in normal operation, once this chip's running, it'll be switching that on and off at very high frequency, which is why it, they can use a small transformer uh, in with such efficiency, because otherwise this would have a massive transformer in it. The higher the frequency, the smaller transformer you can get off with. The output of that will be going to the other side via diode and a capacitor, and that will be the uh, actual low voltage out. But there's usually another winding that looks like this, and with a diode and it's called the bootstrap circuit. And what happens is that as soon as uh, the voltage in this capacitor reaches a high enough voltage, the chip starts running, it starts driving the main coil in the transformer, that couples current to the output, but also couples current to the small auxiliary winding, which is used sometimes just for uh, power, but sometimes also for a feedback signal. But in this case, as soon as it's powered, it charges that capacitor directly via the diode, so it doesn't need those resistors anymore. It's powering itself from the circuitry. And one of the most common problems that causes that flashing is failure of the winding, the diode, the capacitor, something in that circuit not working. Now, we've already proven the capacitor is working because it is trying to run. So this is one possibility that one of these components has failed. It could be a dry joint in the transformer. Uh, let's uh, investigate that. So I've got the uh, meter here, set conveniently to continuity. Continuity should show uh, the winding continuity. Let's just test it along the primary winding. Yeah, getting continuity. Uh, this is the, there's the diode. So I should get about 0.6-ish 6, 6 volts, roughly. Uh, let's bring this in so you can actually see it. 0.6 volts, That's, that diode looks alright, and the solder looks alright around it. This uh, looks just looks like a 10 ohm resistor. Yeah, so it's just, uh, uh, it's feeding the, the capacitor on the other side, yes, it's feeding this small capacitor, that's a bootstrap capacitor. That other capacitor next to the bootstrap capacitor, this one, is actually a smoothing uh, capacitor for the power supply going out to the, the logic control on the front circuit board. So now, uh, what about the windings then? Nothing. I would have expected, unless they're very high impedance, let's put it to 2K. Nothing. I'm not getting anything from the bootstrap winding. I'm pretty sure that is the bootstrap winding. And that would suggest, if there isn't, the solder joints look okay, I'm just going to try and probe down into here and see if I can make contact. Nothing. I can see the two windings there coming down. That would almost suggest that one of these windings... Oh, there it is. Right, okay. Let me show you what I've discovered. One of those windings is broken. It may be in transit, the vibration of the transformer has done that, but uh, if we zoom in here and I add a little light into this, can you see that little uh, white wire there? It's a sleeved wire. Let me poke that with the probe. And it's just off. Right, that's quite annoying. 
How easy is that going to be to re-terminate? It's not going to be easy to re-terminate. I may have to remove the transformer for that, and that is going to get extremely messy. Right, I tell you what, I'm going to start, I'm going to try removing this transformer right now. I'm going to put on the solder iron, put the meter out to the side, and if it takes too long, if it starts turning into one of those arduous things, uh, I shall uh, pause uh, just while I, I do it, because sometimes removing these transformers can be very hard. Basically speaking, it's a double-sided circuit board. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, it's really hard getting the solder off both sides, particularly for such a high mass joint. And, oh no, you, it's worse, it's worse, it's worse. Ah, that's annoying, it's trapped under this big heat sink. Oh, that is so annoying. Right, okay. Let's uh, improvise, shall we? By trying to strip that, uh, and try and solder into that, and patch it back onto the circuit board. So it's this connection here, which is also going, it's, uh, no it is, it's not, it's not, it's, I'm talking crap, it is, just seems to be doing that feedback. I don't think it's doing any sensing. It is just power. Okay, so I'm going to try, and very carefully, wheedle in, and get access to that end. The sleeve is just kind of sliding off, that's not great because that sleeve is kind of needed to for insulation purposes. I'm not sure how good the quality of this power supply actually is. Uh, from the text in the front, uh, it's not inspiring. It says, product schematic, six USB charger with a digital display. Why product schematic? It's just like they used words randomly. So let's try and slide the sleeve back in. Oh yes, yes, that's good. And get a bit of wire. This is all going to be a bit of rocket surgery. And it's also, you know what, it's also very tight in there and it's very dark. You're not going to see a thing in there. Uh, but I've just stripped that wire back. And now I'm going to try and solder on. I tell you what, I'm just going to pause momentarily because this is going to be very fumbly and it's all going to be in there in the dark. So you're probably not going to see much. So I'll uh, just uh, pause momentarily. And one piece of delicate keyhole surgery later, I'll show you what I've done here. Uh, can you see that, what I've done in there? It's the wire coming up from the bottom and then tacking onto that wire. Let's uh, zoom in a little bit. Let's uh, zoom right in and see. So that bit of wire that's coming up from there and then tacking onto the lead that's coming out of the transformer. And to solder on down there, I couldn't actually get soldering iron in there. I had to actually hold it in from this side and tin it while heating from the other side. So all the heat was applied from this pad here. But that is now it back in the circuit, and I reckon that should work now. So there's one way to find out, and that's to shove it back in and power it back up again. Incidentally, what I was going to use, uh, let's zoom back out here, what I was going to use to try and get that transform out before it was, it was trapped in, was these. Uh, these are stainless steel desoldering tubes. It's a little handle with a stainless steel tube in it. And you choose the size that the outer diameter can go through the printed circuit board hole, but the inner diameter can go over the pin. And you melt the solder and you press this in from one side to the other and let it cool. And the soldering, the stainless steel will not stick to the solder, so you can then wiggle it out and it should theoretically release that component lead. They work okay. So um, let's slide this in, and at the risk of it just going bang, uh, let's try this out. I kind of uh, should I could remove that bit of dirt in there. Let's remove this circuit board and take a look. I could regret this. I see what looks like a couple of screws here. I may have to use a much thinner screwdriver. I'm probably going to regret this completely. It's probably never going to go back in again. Uh, that isn't that screwdriver isn't working. That is a bit annoying. Um, do you want to do this? I don't think I'm going to see an awful lot. I think I'm going to just see USB ports and the LCD display on the other side of the... Uh, there's a little IC in there. I'll just tap this and see if I can knock the... Yeah, the, the stuff's kind of... Yeah, it's kind of... That'll do. That's very professional. So this is going into the guides here. 
And is that going to line up okay? Oh, it has. It's slotted in. Let's put this flimsy clip-on cover. What holds this in? Luck, I think. That's not very good. Okay. So uh, note if you have one of these, the back may just pop off. Rightio, let's power it up and see if it works. And it's working. Okay, so that's that uh, solved. Let's put a load in it. Uh, actually, you know, technically speaking, I should do an electrical test in this, shouldn't I? I think I'd rather do that in the circuit board itself. One moment, please. I'm going to do an electrical test. I'm going to give this a high voltage test from primary to secondary. Okay, testing time. And what I've actually done here, to restrict the uh, area that, of the circuitry that gets tested, I'm only really interested in testing the isolation transformer. I've commoned all the input connections of the transformer on the high voltage side to the um, output connections. I've commoned all the other ones on the low voltage side. So I'm just purely going to be testing from one side of the transformer to the other. So let's uh, do the test then. Let's uh, put this onto a suitable area, turn it on and turn the voltage up. And I'm aiming for about 2,000 volts here. So that's 150. That's 300 volts, 500 volts. One thousand volts. Some leakage current, but that's through the class Y capacitor. There is a class Y capacitor. I'm going to go to two thousand volts. Okay. That sounds all right. I can hear a slight fuzzing, but you often get that fuzzing with the test because at 2,000 volts, you're reaching the ionization voltage. So I'd say that's past the 2,000 volt test. Now, I have been trying to find out what voltage should you be able to test a USB connector, a USB power supply from the input to the output, and I've not found a decisive answer here. I looked at various places and they all gave different answers. The manufacturers were kind of like playing safe with the lower voltages uh, and the test agencies all seemed to have different random numbers. I could have uh, I could have got a copy of the BS uh, electrical regulations regarding such things, but they want uh, £400 for a copy of that. So I'm not going to pay that for just to then to rake through it and find one number. So um, I think, uh, well, do you guys have any idea? What would be the most appropriate uh, voltage range? So let's uh, pop these uh, my soldered link off here. Let's focus back down onto the circuit board. I, assuming I have focused down onto the circuit board again. Yeah, looks pretty good. Let's uh, get my link off and plug this in again, see if I've destroyed it with high voltage. There's always that slight fear that you may have done something terrible. And then after that, let's stick a load in it and see what... Uh, what it is actually putting out. So that's one link off. Here's the next one. I should actually put some fresh solder in this because uh, this is also a fairly large solder joint so it's uh, just absorbing heat from the solder iron a wee bit. That's the peril of large solder joints. I also had soda, uh, that just run out of solder, that's why I can't find my solder here. Let's flood some new solder in. Technically speaking, you only need to connect one end of each winding of the transformer because the uh, set of resistance under test of the transformer windings is actually fairly low, so it's the, they're kind of bridged together anyway, the currents we're talking here. Very delicate one, this. I'm not going to spend too long on this one because, uh, like you said, spending far too long on it. Because this is the one that I've soldered the old wire on the other side and I don't want to... Uh, yeah, I don't want to risk that wire popping off on the other side. Just check those solder joints are all good, and also check my wire hasn't popped off the other side with the... But sometimes when you heat a solder connection, the heat travels through and uh, affects other components. In this case, that little wire link that I put in, I'm just making sure it is still soldered. Yes, it is. So let's put this back together and let's plug a tester into it. Uh, assuming it still works now, I've zapped it with 2,000 volts. How is this supposed to be stuck on? It's got a pattern. I wonder if this has been whacked in the shipping and that's why that wire's come off and this is kind of cracked. It looks as though it's been kind of 
glued or ultrasonically welded in some way, but th these are kind of recessed. That's a bit dodgy, that definitely needs uh, stuck together. I'm not sure if Paul actually wants this back or if he's a... Uh, I'll ask if he wants it back, but point out this is the situation. That's assuming it still works after I've blown 2,000 volts through it. Let's get the solder out of the way while I'm poking about with uh, sloppy connections here. So here's a display, 5 volts, uh, and what happens if I plug one of my loads in? So let's uh, plug this into output 5 and turn it up. Okay, as soon as I... I could have tried and focus onto this, not sure that's going to go. As soon as I turn it up to... Well, let's actually point it right, right up and see if you can actually see this or not. Zoom in. As soon as I turned uh, the socket 5 up to about 70 milliamps, the position 5 started flashing. Let's turn it up higher. I'm not sure what the current uh, limit is in these outputs. I'd guess 2 amps, typically. 2.3. Now it says 5 volts. Is it really 5 volts? I should have actually used another test from this to see what was happening. 2.7 amps, 3 amps. 3.5 amps. 4 amps. 4 volts. Right, tell you what, let's, let's, uh, that's way up to 4.6 amps. That's got no real current limiting the 5 volt in the output of that, which is going to suit some projects. Uh, let's get the, let's get my little tester and put it in. Let's go in line with outlet 2 this time. And let's uh, zoom down on this now. Uh, outlet 2 isn't even... Oh, why is output 2 not... Oh, there it is. Uh, pop the tester in. 5.22 volts. Is it showing? Yes, it is splashing the outlet too. 5.08. So, five. It's the voltage is dropping. 4.95 volts at about... Let's go up to 2 amps. Let's go to 2.1. 2.15. 4 4.85 volts. So... Uh, beyond that, the voltage tails off a wee bit, but you know what? Uh, it's showing low about 2.6. I'd say it's rated for about 2.1 amp per output, but I don't know what the rating of the whole thing is. I don't know if it it doesn't say it, doesn't have a label on it. No, there's no data on it. Uh, I wonder if there's data online, I guess. I could go to the shop this came from, which was Gearbest, and I could actually find out if there's data. But that does appear to be it fixed anyway. That's it working. It was... I'll show you what that was in the schematic. It was in the bit I doodled, so let's zoom back out. And the bit that had actually failed was... This is the uh, bootstrap winding. It had failed. The connection, the wire just popped off there from the solder uh, pin. The wire physically snapped from that winding. So uh, by bridging that together, that's basically restored it to normal operation. It can now provide power to itself. And that's why it, wa why it was actually just doing that pulsing thing. What was happening, that capacitor was charging up through the resistors. It was kicking, it was booting up, it was starting the power supply, that's when the output was flashing. But then, because it wasn't providing itself the high current it needed to keep running, uh, that capacitor then discharged until it tripped off again, and then those resistors just kept trickle charging it until it tripped again. I did uh, until it started again, and those were two 1 mega ohm resistors that were in series with that. So, a uh, very typical layout. So that's uh, good that it's working. I shall contact Paul and see if he wants it back now.